picture that's on the board is at the top right. You can read on the piece of paper on the top right, Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 from a modern translation. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors at many different times and in many different ways through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. So there were a lot of different ways that God talked through the prophets in the Bible. Dreams, direct communication, visions, um, sent angels to talk. There's all kind of things, you know. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. That's the part that false prophets don't deal with. In the little cartoon there, Calvin has some snowmen. They're all melting. And their signs say, repent, sinners. The end is near. Spring is coming. And he tells his mama, they're snowmen prophets of doom. And she says, you certainly take the pleasure out of waiting for daffodils. Of course, we don't have that down here, but up north they have the little flowers that bloom first in the spring. Wherever Calvin lives, the snow is melting, his snowmen are melting, and at least he isn't calling his snowmen prophets of God. He probably means the end of winter is near. I don't know. <clears throat> With him, you never know. Men like to call themselves titles, like prophet. That way they can claim authorization for whatever they want to do or teach by saying the Lord said they could live that way or the Lord gave them their doctrines and told them to teach them to men. We're not going to really stop and read it. But in Acts chapter 5, they have some of the apostles have been drawn onto the carpet by the high council of the Jews and are considering punishing them very severely. And a man who's very learned named Gamaliel, the same Gamaliel that educated Saul who became the apostle Paul, and he tells them in verses 36 and 37, there was a man named Thutis, T-H-E-U-D-A-S. And he got 400 followers together and they went out into the wilderness and perished. I looked that up and as near as I could find, he told people he was the Messiah and that the Messiah and his people were supposed to go out into the wilderness the popular idea of the day was we'll gather an army together and then we'll come back and we'll defeat Rome. And the second man was a man named Judas of Galilee, not of the apostles. And he got followers together and he also went out and perished. Apparently, he said God gave him a vision that the Jews shouldn't have to pay taxes to the Romans. And so he sort of started a tax revolt. But both of those fellows were kind of like false prophets who got followers together, but God wasn't backing them. Below that, false prophets and God's true messengers are talked about in Isaiah 44. It's actually the last part of 24 through 26. Let's read that. God says, Who is with me, causing the signs of false prophets to fail and making fools of fortune tellers, 
making wise men retreat and turning their knowledge into foolishness. He, God, confirms the word of his servants and fulfills the plan of his messengers. So he's saying, by and large, when people were false prophets, their claims didn't come to pass. At least God didn't make them come to pass. But when they were his prophets, everything they said happened just the way he said. In keeping with our introduction, we're going to talk about false prophets who claim to be speaking for God, but are not. In Jeremiah 23, verses 30 and 32, there's at least four methods that false prophets used. They used them way back there before Christ. They used them in the time of Christ, and they use them today. Let's read those verses together. I'm against the prophets who steal my words from each other, declares the Lord. I'm against the prophets who speak their own thoughts and say they speak for me. I'm against those who prophesy dreams they made up, declares the Lord. They tell the dreams they made up and lead my people astray with their lies and their wild talk. I didn't send them or command them to go. They don't help these people at all, declares the Lord. Now, I doubt that false prophets in the world today People, whether they're men or women, who claim they have authorization from God to speak for God by some type of inspiration, I doubt they'd like to be described that way. They don't put on their website, I am a false prophet. I steal my words from other people. I speak my own thoughts and claim they're from God. I prophesy dreams I made up. I lead people astray with lies and wild talk. They probably wouldn't have too many what they call followers if they did that, would they? But that's God's way of looking at it. And you see, we're either going to look at it God's way or we're going to look at it their way. There's not some in-between where everybody and everything can be right. Second, there's always a demand for false prophets because rebellious people want them. Isaiah 30, 9 and 10, let's read that. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not Hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not to us right things, speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Now again, <clears throat> they don't write these people letters and say that's what they want. Lie to us. But they don't want to hear what God says. So they, but they want it to sound good, smooth, you know. Where they can say, oh, so-and-so, boy, you ought to hear him. He's good, you know. But God says they're rebellious people. We mentioned before in Acts chapter 5, Two men, Thutis and Judas of Galilee. Thutis apparently claimed he was the Messiah. 
and that he wanted all of his people to go out into the wilderness so they could gather a big army and take over. Oh, that's rebellious. And rebellious people followed him and died over it. And Judas said, God tells me we're not supposed to give taxes to these stinking Romans. Well, the people who wanted to rebel and not pay taxes to the Romans, badly enough, followed him again to their own destruction. But they wouldn't hear the law of the Lord. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's or to the Lord the things that are the Lord's. <clears throat> Third point, in 2 Peter 2, verses 10 through 19, and this whole second chapter of 2 Peter 2 is about false prophets and false teachers. But he says some things about their nature. And I've quoted from these verses. In verse 10 he says, These false teachers are bold and arrogant. Some of you look on sites where they have these false prophets. Do they come on and say, You know, I could be mistaken, but maybe, maybe this might be true. Is that the way they present themselves? Or do they present themselves as one who deservingly has the authority by divine right to say what they're saying? They're bold in that they're confronting God that way. They're arrogant because they dare to oppose the actual teachings of God. And we read that in these last days he spoke to us through his son. In verses 14 through 16 of 2 Peter 2, <clears throat> he talks about how they're involved with money. And he says, And heart they have exercised with covetous practices. We can read where Paul wrote to one of the Christian groups and said, don't send me anymore. I have enough. Did you ever hear one of these guys that solicits funds on the radio or the TV say, don't send us anymore. We have enough. They can't get enough. And then they dare to do things like take a million dollars in salary for themselves or build huge condominiums for themselves ride around in luxury cars and in verses 17 through 19 it says these are wells without water you're thirsty, and you can, oh, there's a well, and you come to it, and there's not a drop of water in it. I, I saw a document, years ago, Marilyn and I saw a documentary about a guy who went alone across Central Africa back in the 1960s, I guess. Him and his stuff in a Jeep, and he went. And one place, way out in the middle of nowhere, they told him the water well had dried up. So he came up with the idea that they had to dig deeper. And he got all of the natives in there with, with sticks, whatever they had, shoved, whatever they had, digging deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper till they got to the water. But a well without water is a false promise and false prophets can only make false promises because they don't have any authority from God to make real ones and we read where God said 
I'll mess them up and I'll make it not happen. Page two. Getting kind of to the meat, to the meat, we addressed the question, I kept coming back to this when I was studying this week, why do these false prophets have so many people that follow them? If they didn't have any followers, there'd just be some guy that has a thing on his front door that says, J.E. Brown, prophet of God or something, and people would turn their heads the other way when they walked past. But they do have followers. They build groups and all kind of stuff like that. So first of all, these people that demand false prophets, D1, they may have no knowledge of the Bible and no respect for God's word. I remember Vermaine's great grandson. He was 12 around that. She brought it, he was visiting. She brought him to church here. I don't remember which one it was. It was one of the ones, not the local ones. He had never been in a church in his entire life. She put a Bible in his hands. He had never held a Bible in his hands. His parents had never told him what a Bible was supposed to be. Never in his life had he gone to a Bible class or, a, you know, had never watched anything like that on the television. There are people that just don't have any knowledge of the Bible and they don't have any respect for God's word because they don't know what it is. They don't have a clue. And if they get wrapped up with one of these people, they'll start quoting all that stuff just like they knew what they were doing. And they don't have a clue about that either. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Let's read that. That at that time ye were without Christ having no hope and without God in the world. Now Paul expresses that as a very tragic circumstance and then talks about the wonderful grace of God that he died for them and let them become part of the saved body of people. And, and that's like people like you and me, see. Secondly, along the same lines, D2, they may not understand what it took to be a genuine prophet of God. See, there's a lot of people that they don't have any idea between a prophet of Islam or a prophet of, of uh, the Hindu religion a prophet of the Bible, they, 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 you know, they, they're all the same to them. They don't really have a clue what a prophet is. And because of that, they don't know that, that, that there were real prophets. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, I just quoted this part of it. Let's read that. Prophecy was given by the Holy Spirit as humans spoke under God's direction. That's the way the genuine prophets spoke. If God didn't tell them to say something, they kept their mouth shut. If they spoke as a prophet, and we have a number of instances you can read in the book of Acts where Genuine prophets spoke, and they spoke because God, through the Holy Spirit, told them to speak. But P 
people out in the world, they don't have a clue about that. They think maybe a prophet's a highly educated person or something like that. Has a doctorate of theology, so he's an elder and a prophet or whatever, you know. They don't know. They have no clue. D3. Along that same line, they may not understand that prophets and teachers can be false. They may be taught anybody that says they're a prophet, you be respectful to them. You just be nice to them. They're a prophet, you know. So it doesn't matter if they're the Hindu or Islamic or, or, or whatever. If they call themselves a prophet, your duty is to say yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, and honor them because they're a prophet. They just don't know that you can be false prophets. Second Peter 2, verse 1. Let's read that. False prophets were among God's people in the past as false teachers will be among you. God says so. There will be false prophets. Well, there will be false teachers. A prophet is one who speaks for God or teaches for God. So he's really saying the same sort of thing. But see, they've never read 2 Peter 2.1. And if they read it, they wouldn't understand it because they don't understand the Bible is a book from God. D4. Now the rubber meets the road. They may prefer the private interpretation of the false prophets. It may scratch their itching ears, Paul says in Timothy. I think it's Timothy. First Peter 1, 20 and 21. Let's read that. First, you must understand this. No prophecy in Scripture is a matter of one's private interpretation. When I taught at the academy, I had the Hardest, one of the hardest things was to get kids to understand God interpreted his prophecies. If we don't have God's interpretation of prophecy, then we have a prophecy that we're not really sure what it means. So there's time and time again in the New Testament when it says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah or whoever and you know and it tells you that's the way you know that that prophecy was fulfilled because God tells us oh and then I would tell him the book of Revelation do we have an explanation from God about those prophecies the answer is no, we don't. We don't have God explaining all the things about beasts and dragons. And Men love to tell you it was definitely the emperor of Rome. You know, they, this is, so I said, well, no, it was uh, this Emperor Justinian in six. No, it was, it was here. No, it was, you know. They are sure they know the answer and they don't have God's word. Tell them in the simple language, here's what this prophecy means. Prophecy can have no private interpretation. But people that seek false prophets may look around for one that says an interpretation that they like. I like what this guy says. Along similar lines, D5, they may want sexual freedom to dishonor the way of truth. Not me that says that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Let's read that. 
many will follow them in their sexual freedom and will cause others to dishonor the way of truth. And one of the great characteristics of, of false prophets today is they explain away and so homosexuality is all right, same-sex marriage is all right, uh, being married 14 times is all right, adultery is just, you know, uh, they just, we're all human, you know, and, and God loves us, and wait a minute, but that doesn't sound like God's word. The reason it doesn't sound like God's word is simply because it isn't God's word. It's the word of false prophets and false teachers. But many want that. D6, the last one on page 2. They may like to deny the Lord or like to believe false teachings. 2 Peter 2, 1. They shall bring in damnable heresies, they will deny the Lord who has bought them. And you know, when somebody says the Savior of the world is not the Son of God, they're denying the Lord. When somebody says Jesus was not born of a virgin, they're denying the Lord. When somebody says, oh, he, he was a good man, he spoke good things, but he didn't work all those miracles, they're denying the Lord. And they're replacing it by trying to pump themselves up in the eyes of the people, so believe me. Top of page three, the last one of these. They may be susceptible to good-sounding argument, easily exploited. When I was young, I was susceptible to colds and sinus problems. I had them all the time. I knew winter colds, autumn colds, spring colds, summer colds. I knew infected this and infected that. I was susceptible. And some people are susceptible to a good sounding argument. Well, that makes sense. You know what? There's things in the Bible that don't make sense to me. Oh, do you know of a scripture that says where God demands of his children that everything he ever did makes sense to you? There's some stuff that just, I look at it and it just puts my head whirling. And so congregation, congregations don't usually talk about it because you can't really figure it out. But some people, if you just give them a good sounding argument, man, you have really settled that, Matthew. And the trouble is, if you've got a good sounding argument, I can make a good sounding argument. He or she can make a good sounding argument and people can believe whichever argument they choose. Some people, that's just what they like. They're easily exploited. They're easily used. And if we can use the expression, they become anybody's dog that'll hunt with them. So around this person, they act like everything they say is all right. Then they go over here around this person, everything they say is all right, you know. Around that, everything they say is all right. And they're just used. It's like they didn't have their own mind or didn't have the right to have a mind or like it was more important to agree with everyone than it was to stand for anything. So these are just some ideas 
about why some people follow false prophets. E, the next point, is the plight of those who follow false prophets. They're in a mess. E1, God means nothing to them. The true God Almighty really doesn't mean anything to them. They don't bow down to him. They don't say, whatever you want, Lord, they say to this false prophet, whatever you want. You tell me what to worship, I'll worship it. You, you tell me how to worship, I'm, I'm yours. They're not gods. Jude, verse 4. There are no chapters in Jude. Let's read that. They are people to whom God means nothing. They use God's kindness as an excuse for sexual freedom. God loves you too much to condemn. He made you the way you are. He wouldn't condemn you for doing what you're made to do. Good sounding arguments, maybe. Exploiting people, yeah. But not honoring the power of God. God means nothing to them. And E2. God will execute judgment on them for their ungodliness. Of course, they have no idea about this because they've never read the book of Jude. They've never read in the Bible. They don't even know what it means to be ungodly. But let's read Jude verses 14 and 15. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You know, maybe you make a comment on one of these internet sites or something and somebody comes back at you like a rabid dog or something they're treating God that way too and God says there'll come a day when he'll take their measure for that because they're speaking as ungodly sinners and they're making hard speeches against God they're in a terrible fix. E3, along a similar line, what about true Christians who are falling into this, who get drawn away into this? There are Christians who say, well, the church is so stuffy, and I, 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 I like what this guy says over here, and they, Start listening to more of that and less of this and then more of that and less of this and more of that and less of the Bible until they're not considering the Bible anymore and they're just considering the false teacher. Second Peter 2.20, let's read that. People can know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and escape the world's filth. But if they get involved in this filth again and give in to it, they are worse off than they were before. It's a whole different sermon, but one of the reasons they're worse off is you and I cannot say words to change them. It has to come within themselves to change. It can happen. But you and I are really powerless once they've known the Lord and rejected him. Hebrews 6, verse 6. Let's read that. They crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. And I know that's some of the concern that people have 
if you know people that are following this stuff or are you you're concerned about the people that follow this kind of stuff and concerned about their souls it's terrible where they're headed so page four we come to the question what can we do to help them it would be nice if the Bible had a formula in there you know put three drops of mercury and two drops of potassium and one teaspoon of, of uh, baking soda in there or something a teaspoon of flour and mix it all together and, burn, and then add a meat it like an antidote for a poison or something but the Bible doesn't have something like that so thinking about things number one we can understand God's truth and follow it ourselves before everyone. We can't afford to be anybody's dog that'll hunt with them. When a false prophet is telling a spiel, we can't wish them God's feet or good luck. And I... It, just being nice, we kind of want to say something like that, but Matthew 5, 16. Let's read that. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. One of the things we can do is live right as a Christian. We definitely don't want to descend to the level of making hard speeches and vitriol and nastiness back at the people that treat us that way. We're to be Christ-like. And when he was reviled, he reviled not again. But we can understand God's truth and follow it ourselves in front of the world. Number two, and this is provided someone allows us to, we can try to teach them gracefully and truthfully. By gracefully, I only mean without the bitterness, without... Um, profanity and without you know if we can keep from losing our temper that kind of thing Colossians 4 6 let's read that let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man that's not saying I have to know everything about the arguments against this denomination or that denomination it's saying that I, I need to have God in my knowledge. And when I speak, I need to be, you know, courteous and, and nice if I can. But I need to put truth in there with it. It's not wrong to tell somebody the truth. It's right to tell them the truth. And three... We can pray for them. 2 Timothy 2 1. Let's read that. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And we don't need some fancy dance to get around that. We just need to realize God intends us to pray for everybody. I may not know everything to pray for them. But I can pray that they might not follow nonsense or they might not follow some self-serving false prophet. Doesn't necessarily mean that they'll stop doing it. But I'm praying for what's right. Then the last thing is what 
the person who's in the grips of following a false prophet, what they can do for themselves. In a matter of fact, if they won't do this, they're probably not going to get out of following false prophets. Number one, honor God's word in the Bible. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible never says the word of the false prophet is truth. And 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto every good work. See, the fact that they don't know that and they don't honor that, they have no idea. But that's what God says. So, so, so God says you've got to honor his word in the Bible. And, and nobody can do that for someone else. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. Neither one of us can do it for a false prophet. And neither one of us can do it for somebody that's following him. A false prophet. Number two. They have to have respect for the true biblical prophets of God. If they read about them, they'll read that what they said happened. One of the most amazing studies I ever did, it was years ago, I had a Bible that had what's called a synchronous history of the nations. And on big fold-out pages, it had the little country of um, Jerus Jerusalem and Judea and you know Palestine. Then it had every country around them listed. And it told what was happening in those other countries while stuff was going on in the Bible. And I found that every last prophecy of Isaiah about the nations that surrounded Palestine, every last prophe prophecy he made came to pass. When he said and the way he said because his words came from God. There's no worldly prophet that's like that. Not a single one. In 2 Peter 3 verse 2, Paul, uh, Peter is talking about how they the apostles received the message by being around Jesus, following him, knowing him, and how they came to conclude that the prophets of the Bible are absolutely the real thing. But when people don't know that, then they think, well, you know, people make prophecies, they don't all happen. What of it? They don't know the difference between fakes, false, and the real prophets of God. Three, they need to reject the self-proclaimed prophets. They have to get there. In 1 John 4, 1, he's talking about a time when inspiration was still in the world. I don't believe it is now. But he says, try the spirits, whether they be of God. We still have to, if we don't do that, then we, we might believe anybody that claims they're a prophet. 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 said, if anybody thinks he has the Spirit, let him agree that what I'm writing is the truth. That's where the rubber meets the road. Why is it that these false prophets all have some different message than the Bible? Oh, maybe it's because they're not God's prophets. And a person educates that to them to themselves and honors God's word in the Bible and respects the true biblical prophets, they have trouble rejecting the self-proclaimed prophets. You and I can say, there ain't no way, you know. But look what we believe and what we've come to believe. The other people, if they don't get there, they can't do it until they reject them in their hearts and in their minds and say what they're saying is just not true. They have no right to make these claims. They're not of God. They're going to maybe believe what they're saying and mislead other people. And four, the person who's trying to overcome following them needs to obey and follow Christ responsibly. They can't go with this nonsense about, oh, I, I'm saved by Jesus Christ, but I don't need the Bible and I don't go to church and, you know, I'm not a goody-goody two-shoes. Uh, we're going to read the back side of this sheet now. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, the pathway to hope. Since this world will be destroyed, how shall we live? Let's begin. Seeing Amen. then that all, all these things, things shall, shall be dissolved, be dissolved what, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy, holy manner of life and godliness? And looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. What are we looking for to replace earth? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Live a life without blame. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even, Even as our beloved brother, brother Paul, Paul also, according to the, to the wisdom, wisdom given, given to him, him has written to you, as also in all his letters, letters speaking, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable pervert, as they also the other scriptures to their own destruction. Don't be misled by the error of wicked. You, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen.
So we've looked at some length about the methods that false prophets use, the rebellious people who want the messages from them, the true nature of such false teachers, at a greater length about why some people follow false prophets, about the plight of non-Christians who choose to follow them, and the plight of people who've been Christians who fall away and follow them. And we've seen that as from our own standpoint, all we can do is understand God's truth and follow it ourselves in our lives and all the things that we do. We can try to teach them truthfully. We can try to be gracious about it if they'll let us. And we can pray for them. They, on the other hand, have to come to honor God's word, have respect for the true biblical prophets, reject the self-proclaimed prophets and obey and follow Christ responsibly according to what the Bible says. Number 28 was selected in the white books as an invitation song. If we can help you with your soul salvation, we ask that you make your needs known as we stand together and sing. You ask me why I hope for heaven, why all my sins should be forgiven, why think I'll see the city Four square, walk through the pearly gates up there. My hope is that I'll live forever neath the tree of life by the river. Singing glory to God at his royal throne. Praise the Lord, one day I'm going home. The Son of God has died to set me free. Endured the cross of Calvary. His blood alone can make my robes be white. Baptized, I rose to walk in the light. My hope is that I live forever neath the tree of life by the river singing glory to God at his royal throne praise the Lord one day I'm going home. Now in his holy church I have life again. I pray to God in Jesus' name. I'll run the race that's given with its ups and downs. I'll keep the faith and win a crown. My hope is that I'll live forever neath the tree of life by the river 
Singing glory to God at His royal throne. Praise the Lord, one day I'm going home. In the front of our books is the Lord's Prayer. Let's read that together, then we'll ask George to lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdoms come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again, we thank you for giving us this day and allowing us to be here in your house of worship to sing you songs of praise and worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, dear Lord, for once again allowing Brother Ed to be with us to deliver and to guide us in the teaching and understanding of your word. We pray, the Lord, that you will be with him, his family, the members of this congregation and their families, that as we depart from here, we pray that you will keep us under your protection and that you will help to keep us safe and happy and healthy. And we pray that you will also extend that to our families, our loved ones, and friends. We pray the Lord that today's lesson has increased our knowledge in your word and helped to renew and strengthen our spirit and our faith. We pray that these words will guide us and help us to become better Christians in the future. We pray that we will always strive to live our lives in a manner that is according to your word and pleasing in your sight, that we can somehow inspire others to seek you out through our actions and deeds. We pray that you will continue to stand with us and be with us as we go through our trials and tribulations here on earth. We pray that when our time here on earth comes to an end, that we have lived our lives in a manner that has gained us a place by your side in your kingdom of heaven. We know that you hear our prayers, dear Lord, and if it is your will, it will be done. Thank you for that sacrifice that was made by your son and our savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the remission of our sins, which gives us that avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.